here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week is going to be the turn of the artist, musician, producer, composer. It's the one and only Annie Hogan, who I spoke to very recently to find out more about life, love, poetry and all that other groovy stuff. Um, yes, spent a certain amount of her time in Leeds, having gone there in 79 to study at the university. And while there, met people like Mark Armand, Dave Bull, and went on to be part of that scene, which is uh, Mark and the Mambers, and has had a prolific life in music and the arts ever since, and has recently been releasing some new material. I'll put her website and um, her Bandcamp page in the notes below so you'll find out more about what she is up to at the moment. But um, this is the interview, so after several minutes of interest and but casual chat, we get down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years. Annie, it's over to you. Um, well, of co- yeah, of course. I mean, it's a, a massive musical awakening which never really stopped, I think. Um, probably... I mean, I always say 1964, 65, I got my first record, which was Downtown, um, B-Side, You Better Love Me, I think, uh, Petula Clark, um, written by Tony Hatch. And uh, also, it came out a couple of years earlier, but I had Telstar, which the other side was Jungle Fever, which was the Joe Meek um, production. And those two records were the, yeah, they woke me up and then, forevermore after really everything I mean my sister was 10 is, is 10 and a half years older than me so she had the Beatles and the Walker brothers and Scott Walker written all over everything that she owned the satchel and school things so I was very aware of that started playing all her records had the high fidelity record player um <clears throat> mono record player that you lifted up and I always used to put all the singles in I mean she wasn't really that bothered she loved she loved doing the things like she saw the Beatles at the cabin. She did. She saw Paul and Richie in the crying chains, uh, um, <clears throat> in the Isle of Man and stuff like that. So I had all those records. Plus, my mum and dad had been in Africa in the fifties. Um, they'd moved out there. My dad had a job out there in the at the Ports Authority, and they lived in Lagos. And my mum ran a nightclub there called the Apapa Club. And when they came home which was like about 60, I was born in 61. And they brought all the records that were in the jukebox. And so I had all those uh, little treasures to go through as well. So there's a lot of big band and uh, Harry Belafonte, Frankie Vaughan, all sort of 50, Alma Kogan, never do a tango with an Eskimo. I can see them all now in the box. So I I was very much affected by music. It just hit me and it was was the world that I wanted to inhabit, you know. Yes, absolutely. And did and did they sort of nudge you in a nice and groovy way towards kind of playing an instrument or singing? Oh uh, no, I, I mean I no. Um, I mean they were they helped me very much and supported it, but I nudged myself to be honest. It was all my interest and me just searching music out. And they gave me, I mean they did give me some bongo drums and uh, little bongos, which I still got little and uh, little. I, mean, I wish they weren't goatskin now. Awful. But, you know, <laughs> I've still got them anyway. And, you know, I've, I've said things to say. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but, you know, they were, they did come from Africa in the 50s. So I've got those. Yes. And had, they got me a junior drum kit. I mean, <laughs> the things I must have put them through because they were a bit older, you know, when they had me. Because, like I said, my sister's 10 and a half years older. So, um, yeah, I mean, I probably put them through a lot playing a little drum kit. And I had, you know, I was playing along to, like, the Top of the Pops album and stuff like that. Um, but the main thing was that I went to my cousins for lunch because um, my mum was working, my dad was working. So I went to my cousins for lunch, which was around the corner from our house in Oxton, which is in Birkenhead on the Wirral, a little village. <clears throat> and um, yeah, they had a piano and I used to go and literally I'd, you know, rush my lunch down and just play the piano every lunchtime. That was about a six, six, seven. Right. I played like mad. I mean, I could play... You know, I was saying this to Martin Ware the other day, but I was saying I could play with two hands str- straight away. I mean, not, not brilliant, but I could play with two hands straight away and pick out pick out tunes, you know. I mean, and just pick out little tunes that I, I was good at doing. 
And then, right. you know, mum and dad sort of saw how involved I was with that. And eventually it saved up and everything. And they got me piano lessons and the piano when I was 12. And uh, I just played it nonstop, you know. Fantastic. I mean, so whereabouts were you growing up, by the way? In Head, which is on the Wirral, uh, up yes. north, northwest. Yes, I think I think Morrissey and the Smiths re re referenced Birkenhead, didn't he? In one of his songs, it took it took a tattooed guy from Birkenhead to really change her mind, something like that. I don't know. I'm uh, I'm not a Smith. I've got to say, I'm not a Smith fan. That's I fine. Can. We can we we can put that right out. That's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like or don't like. I just I'm not. You know, I'm not. I sort of I'm just you know not a Smith person in that way. No, but I think that's where a lot of Smiths fans probably remember. Oh, I know Birkin. Well, not know where it is, but certainly do. Did your sister? But you know, because being having a a, a a sibling who's older, and you mentioned the Walker brothers. I mean, did, did she also sort of drag you to any early gigs at all, no, or, or sort of? No, because I mean, she was like sixteen, seven. I was like six and seven. You know, she was sixteen, seventeen. I mean, the first gig I ever went to actually was uh, Kate Bush at the. Liverpool, oh, where was it? Liverpool Empire, was it? I, said, like, I oh, think it was the Empire, yes. The Empire. It was her first ever gig, and, and it was my first ever gig. <laughs> so I think it was 1979. Yes, it was, and I think she just did one brief, not brief tour, but just one tour, didn't she? And then she yeah. didn't do any more touring. It was mind-blowing. I mean, I'm not even that, you know, I don't have loads of a record or anything like that, or... But she, uh, it was pretty uh, mind blowing that show. It certainly switched me, you know, even further on, sort of thing. Yes, absolutely. I I do remember that album, The Kick Inside, which I know, um, yeah, Weather and Heights you couldn't sort of yeah. avoid. But then <laughs> but the rest of what was that? Sorry, Is, how's the signal? Um, I was saying Weathering Heights. I remember very much being in the charts. Yes, that, I think that got to number one. And she was very, I remember sort of obviously seeing the way she danced was going to definitely have a big influence on, I don't know, 13, 14 year old people at school. Because, um, yes, yeah, up to then, we, I don't know, it was either disco or the Wurzels, really, and a, very, a few other strange and wonderful bits on top of the pops, which was kind of a, a religious experience to watch on a Thursday, really, wasn't it? So there you go. But Kate Bush, I have to say, all the people, and I've, you know, quite a lot of people I've interviewed, um, I think that's probably the coolest. And and I've never met anybody else who's seen Kate Bush live in that moment in 79, which I think is unique, really. <laughs> yes. So you were 18 at that stage. Did you then, so you, had you taken A-levels at this point? I had, or I was I was doing them probably. I don't know when she played, but I was probably do, doing them at the time. Yeah, I did A-levels and went to university in Leeds do international history and politics which lasted i mean once i got to leeds it was like record shops and gigs and going out and yes and that was that and university was uh, a very second the big second to that and I, I i just did you know a few months of pretending to go really absolutely <laughs> actually I, it's I think, I mean, it was interesting last week, I think most of the people I've interviewed went to a university because they'd heard it was a good music scene. This is in the 80s. And um, and it, it worked. They, they went there, vaguely studied, but most, I had most no of the time. Idea of the music scene in Leeds, or I didn't go for a music scene. Do you know, it was a really strange calling with Leeds. I just had to go. It was first on my list. It was the only university I wanted to go to, but I, I can't tell you why. I mean, I thought it was because of the course, but now I think it's because I was meant to meet Mark, you know, and, and all that, and do all yes. that. Okay, and, you know, it's sort of, I'm, I immerse, you know, I sort of, that's where it all grew from Leeds, really. I mean, I, I, was, I was already formed in a musical, in a lot of musical ways, but once I got to Leeds, it was like, you know, inverted commas, I mean, career, I hate that word, but, you know, Yes, because wow. earlier this year, I did an interview with a guy who just wrote a book called Gavin Butt, who did one on the Leeds art oh, experiment yeah. scene, which is called No, was it No Machos or Pop Stars when the Leeds art experiment went punk? So it's all about the Gang of Four and the, the Three Johns and the Mekons and, and that kind of very arty world of the art school in Leeds. So you had you not come across that world? I mean, I, I, was, I was aware of them, but no, I mean, I went in, they were a bit earlier than that. I, was, I went in 79 and I went, I mean, my world was like, 
was, you know, I mean, I went to, it was like a jukebox in a, in a, in a pub called the Faversham with this really cool sort of Barry lookalike barman. I mean, real proper Barry lookalike, Madame Barry dressed like Barry. Keep the mind, it's a lot at the bar. Was oh, nice. We like a bit of Bowie mime. Cool. I'm very funny and, and camp as anything. And the jukebox was amazing. I mean, the Mekons, Mekons were in the jukebox, Soft Cell was in the jukebox, Iggy, Susie, everything. And um, so that jukebox w- was something I was very interested in. And then I went, I, I went down and um, Started washing glasses at a bar which had opened called the Amnesia. After I'd been for a few nights out to Leeds Warehouse, so mine was all sort of accessed by nights out. And you know, Mark was DJing at the warehouse. I think the first time I went, and it was like amazing music, even if it was the uh, drop the needle <laughs> all right through the record sometimes. <laughs> but the music was amazing, and so you know, I was drawn to soft soft cell were in the Faversham you know, quite often, you know, all dressed in black and looking dark and mysterious. And I was very drawn to them. And yes. I ended up, the guy who was de- DJing at the place where I went to wash glasses, Amnesia, um, which was in Queen Square, I think it's called, opposite the station in Leeds anyway. And it was Ian Dewhurst, who was like a Northern Soul, bit of a Northern Soul legend, really, DJ. And uh, he was also working at the warehouse, but he was he was DJing at the Amnesia anyway a lot. and. I used to ask him for loads of records like the Human League, Soft Cell, whatever, you know, and Bowie. And he just ended up saying, look, come and, you know, he was always playing disco and, and, and what have you. So he got me to, he said, come on, why don't you play a few records that you want to play, have a go sort of thing. So I had a go and that was it. Uh, you know, my access to a lot of the Leeds music scene was from DJing. And, and so it was. You know, it was meeting, it was Soft Cell, it was Vicious Pink Phenomena, it was sort of that lot, that gang kind of thing. I mean, I was aware, you know, Mekons and used to see the sisters around quite a bit and used to go and see them for for things. And Claire was was a DJ who who was going out with Andy Eldritch at the time and um, used to see her quite a bit around. I mean, I didn't know her, but used to see her quite a bit around and... uh, she was probably a bit of a, an, a rival and an inspiration, I think. She was doing it before. She's a bit of a Debbie Harry lookalike. She looked so cool. So that, you know, got me to look out more records. She was playing, you know, a bit more of that lead scene. So, yeah, yeah this was just accessed by That's those. right, because obviously Leeds has, I think there's just been a new compilation on Cherry yeah. Red Records, isn't there? I'm on it. And you're on it. A, a track of mine off Kickabye, which was written with the, uh, Jessamy Calkin. It was recorded and, and written in London, but um, you know they've included me, which uh, on the Leeds thing because you know my whole everything began in Leeds and uh, all my touching stones were in Leeds. So it was it was you know I'm really glad I'm on there. It's, it seems good. To yes, be and did and did you kind of get immersed a little bit in the fanzine world and meet people like I don't know, I don't know his surname, but it's Richard something like Ruski. I don't know. No. no. The, and I know James Brown, who then went on to do Loaded in the 90s. He also wrote a very good book last year. And that first bit of it was about being in Leeds and that kind of the fanzine world and sort of the club world and the not, the, you know, not night clubs in that, but alternative clubs and, and gigs and the Mekons and Three Johns. So did you so did you sort of form quite a community at that stage or was it quite fluid? Um, I, I mean, I... I, I mean, the, there were communities. I wouldn't say, I, I certainly didn't. I was very much a, a solo kind of person that hung around with people that were, you know, like people like Mark and Dave. I mean, I ended up moving into the flat with them from Soft Cell. So I don't know, a community. I mean, we just hung, hung around, you know, people who went to the Phono, went to Amnesia, went to the warehouse, you know, sort of like-minded interested in the same music as I know about well I mean you know sort of the cool people the ones who were getting beaten up all the time <laughs> <laughs> I mean I don't know but I mean there probably were communities it's just I'm not I'm not I'm sort of I've always felt an out probably because I wasn't from Leeds as well I felt felt a little bit of an outsider but always warmly treated and part of it all but you know a little bit that's probably being a DJ as well you just I was just a little bit outside it you know and I enjoyed that 
think. You know? Yes, so absolutely. I was with people and, and part of everybody. I mean, I wasn't like a weirdo, uh, but I, I was very much it just, it's just always the music with me, you know, rather than anything else. Yes, and it was it was kind of an in, it was an interesting period. Shop going through records, you know, yes. etc. Absolutely. So with with that kind of we had that punk world, and then the post punk period, and then sort of that early eighties. Obviously, we had you know Thatcher coming in in seventy nine, and then you know the the Falkland War, the the sort of um, I suppose there was the minor strike. There was you know the whole. Green and common experience and things like that. Did did that political well, world sort of seep into your life at all? I mean, I mean uh, right from very early on. Yes, I mean, I was, you know, in 1970, <laughs> I had I got my Duke of Edinburgh's award just before I left school, and the Duke of Edinburgh actually gave it me. Um, <clears throat> and it was uh, I had I made a massive badge, such a t- <laughs> a massive badge which said. Vote Labour, May the 3rd, 1979. A massive badge that I wore. And I remember distinctly him tapping the badge and laughing. And uh, and I was, you know, I was like, because I, I was very, very political at school because all the, you know, I did history, I did politics, music, etc. But history and politics, A-level of music. And the, the, those teachers, they were all like, you know, the guy who taught politics, like had an SS collection, you know, and a, a, a German Nazi stuff collection and all that. And, you know, there were, I just was the opposite of that and was always, you know, having massive arguments with everybody. It's got a bit of a sort of, you know, obviously just always been what, what somebody might call a rebel, but, you know, certainly in conflict with the authority, just challenging yes. things. So, yes. And then, of course, I was affected by her. Thatcher was, you know, it was awful dark times and Leeds was like Liverpool, you know, Liverpool was falling apart back in the head. Leeds was just, you know, falling apart. But out of all that misery you know there's always you know cultural backlash isn't there you know so the music well, absolutely the cultural you know the kids were were, were reacting to the yes. uh, darkness you know with with their own kind of you know electronic light <laughs> and did you um at that stage because i know leeds was also quite had a lot of squats and then you know you had that anarcho punk scene and people like chumbawamba suddenly started living in community and sort of developing a band and also a label a bit later on. Did did you did they come into your sort of orbit at all or were you same I, I think they did the pole touch record which I did later down the line. But I mean I wasn't I didn't know them in Leeds. I think I might have left Leeds by then. I'm not sure when they were when they uh began. But I mean I was in that housing uh, association place which was I mean it wasn't a squat, but it was pretty much a bit of a dump. <laughs> <laughs> yes a lot of squats around i mean, used to go to some parties over in in some squats in chapel town which were pretty amazing <laughs> yes so it was it kind of 80 82 83 you finished your d- degree in in um at leeds uni i didn't do i didn't do my degree i mean i i just went for you know i went for a, a the, the first year but i took i mean i just didn't go so i took a year out and never went back i mean once i discovered music once I discovered music once I discovered um DJing and and record jumbo records you know yes. which is the most amazing record shop in Leeds it's moved now but it was in the Merion Centre which is where the phonographic was which is what I did a lot of my DJing but I uh, well you know and going to gigs at the Re- Leeds refectory you know seeing my 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 my, f- my freshest gig you know I mean the buzzcocks which was amazing but supporting was joy division which was just fantastic you know i'd never seen anything you know like it kind of thing and i saw a magazine at leeds refect and then saw them at the warehouse and oh just loads of brilliant stuff and uh so i, I you know i just completely lost them and i wasn't interested i don't even you know remember being interested at all in any of the courses i just was just yeah plowed on through for a bit but yeah took a year out so there was no finishing the degree there was, <laughs> I, no, there was no going back just I just was DJing from about 80, 81, 82, you know, and then 80, still in Leeds in 83 and also doing the Batcave in London. Right. Um, so you, you sort of slipped from sort of interest and in kind of slightly avant-garde post-punk to, to goth quite smoothly. No, I mean, I, 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 yeah, well, I mean, that's what, 
I mean, I mean, I think Leeds was one of the main places and I was one of the main DJs that was doing that, to be honest, you know, because it's what the music, the great music that was coming through. I mean, I was in, you know, I joined Mark in Mark and the Mambas. So sort of we were sort of sort of heading that kind of, you know, one of the bands sort of in that sort of here, the sisters in Leeds were sort of in that way, it's like Virgin Prunes, all the stuff that I loved was, you know, it wasn't, we didn't call it goth. I mean, it was just amazing alternative music that has then, you know, ended yes. up. And through Mark and the Mambas, you know, I was, I mean, I got asked to DJ at the Bat Cave. And uh, I mean, I was playing, I, I was doing the, um, oh, I was doing that sort of the, a sort of soundtrack to the night as people came in. I was playing music, not on the main dance floor, but first of all, on the stairs as people came in and then, eventually in the in the sort of basement bit so I was playing um you know a lot of soundtrack stuff big band and then all the you know all, all the great tracks that that I love that I love to play back then which I can't which I'm talking to right now I can't think of one <laughs> yeah. for example um you know Dave Ball Soft Cell whatever all the all the great stuff yes absolutely so then did you move out of Leeds and go to London at I did sort of I mean, I, I first of all, I moved in 80. I mean, I was going down to London with Mark quite a lot anyway and staying at the Columbia Hotel, the infamous. But in 83, I moved into um, Lydia Lunch's house because she was over in the States. And, you know, I she lived very near Alvic Studios. And I went down because it was suggested to me by Mark, actually, to uh, do a solo EP. And so I went down, I was going to record in Alvic Studios, which is over in uh, <coughs> uh, West Kensington, sort of over that way. And so Lydia's flat was over there in that area. So I, I stayed at her flat and uh, her house and, um, yeah, started rec recording Kickaby. Right. In London, went down with my uh, poodle pervert who uh, was staying with me all the time. It was a, it was an enriching and amazing time moving to London. It was I felt so free, you know, because Leeds was amazing. Much. It was small, as in, you know, you was the same club, same people all the time, which was, it wasn't a bore or anything, but it was just, I needed more, you know, I needed to spread my wings, stretch my legs. And then... Yes. So did you start to meet people from, is it some bizarre records at this stage, yeah. Steve-O? Yeah, well, I mean, I was, yeah. uh, um, I mean, Mark was on some bizarre, I'd already met Steve-O, he, I mean, I put, when I was DJing at Amnesia in sort of 80, 81, I was also promoting. So I put on Depeche Mode and uh, a few other bands, ACR and Soft Cell in, I think in, in May of 81. So Steve-O was at that gig. So I met him then. And I think right. he was a mean then, you know. Um, and I mean, he was wacky, you know, but I loved his futurist chart. And, uh, you know, he was kind of so ahead of the curve. He was like this, you know, working class bricky, taught himself to read and write guy. I mean, on so many levels, he drove me up the wall. But, you know, I can see that he just was amazing on, on just music initiative and, you know, informing people of great artists and great music and uh yeah going to some bizarre records from then probably when you know whenever mark and dave started going there probably then it was a, a pretty engaging experience but also you know he does drive me up the wall you know misogynist and pain in the ass but the music you know sort of overrid it and he did give me some good dj jobs <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So we, because because so you had started Mark and the and the members sort well, of eighty. Started it, but I, you know, he asked me to to sort of join after he heard. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, heard my he heard a uh, my first ever studio was with Simon Fisher Turner, and um, I did an improvised piano on a, a record of, that he did called Durfee with uh, Colin Lloyd Tucker really nice guys and they were doing it as sort of french country girls <laughs> their feet. Yeah. and uh, so i i yeah i i guessed it on that because matt johnson got me involved um because we'd become friends again like you said some bizarre you know you start getting to know people and um so i did this i did this recording in soho and i took the cassette and uh played it to mark and yeah he was like 
come to the studio and, you know, I think we recorded Sleaze and I, I played the Alecky piano on Fun City. Yes. In Heckman Dwight in Leeds. And then, uh, yeah, then I was in Mark and the Mambas and we, you know, Mark started doing that as a, alongside Soft Cell, which is, I mean, you know, you think what he was doing, sort of amazing Soft Cell stuff. And the Mark and the Mambas untitled album is pretty great, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, and a pretty bold and brave, you know, thing that he embarked on. And, uh, yeah, you know, but everything, you know, I, I look back at these and just think, wow, you know, pretty great. So Yes, absolutely. Because that, that collaboration between Simon and Colin um, to do that, that album, Silence, Silence and Wis Wisdom, yeah. is quite amazing. Because I've done an interview with both of them, oh, Colin, God. quite recently. Yeah. And uh, so it's funny. just it's just an absolutely bonkers story that they kind of had I written this album. And it was it was like, you know, they were being they were sort of being going, get, sort of morphing into the girls. And then, I mean, you know, I mean, Simon, I, I, I had watched on telly, you know, he was in I think he was in Tom Brown School. He was in something called The Chase and a yes. couple of things as a child star. And I was mad on him. I was like, you know, teen, <laughs> teen fan. And then, uh, yeah, and then embarked on this this uh, crazy adventure with them with, with, as two French country girls, you know. And it was a beautiful experience, I have to say. What a fantastic first studio experience for me. You know, yes, they, absolutely. I did just, I put headphones on and they said, well, here's the track. And it was just a French girl, French doll reciting this nursery rhyme over and over again. And then I just sort of played to that. It was like improvised <laughs> piano and string synth sort of thing. But I mean, it was so. What an opportunity. I could just do what I wanted and they went with it. And I mean, it does sound great. It was, you know, but I, it was a, it was such a great thing to be able to do, you know, because it, it was, you know, sort of avant-garde experimental music from day one. So yes, was, absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, was it John Porter was the producer on that album at all? I can't... No, you know, because I was just in with them too. Right, so you... Yes, it was it was quite the project actually, and I have to say, yeah, I mean they're both musically so um, gifted, so um, and interesting. Yes, I think Simon was the kind of David Cassidy of the seventies in the British version, wasn't he? So so gorgeous, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> he is gorgeous. Let's face it. Yeah, he's still gorgeous now, absolutely. Drop yes. So with Mark and the Mambers, then did you from that was was Mark just kind of interested in sort of experimenting outside soft cell at this point yeah i would say so yeah and i think i mean it was a just a chance to yeah experiment be himself and do other stuff you know like cover versions and sort of a different type of music completely you know um sort of more analog sort of different different sensibility to the music you know we were doing we were doing Scott Walker and Jack Brown on, on Untitled, but we were doing, you know, we, we, we were already looking at covers like that. We did, what are we doing? It, was it Caroline Says? I can't remember. But we were doing a lot, a lot of just different sort of music, a lot of piano and vocal, and and then the the psychedelic stuff with Matt. It was, it, you know, it was we did visions, and uh, yes, yeah, it was, it was, it was a, a lovely experimental album, and I think it gave him an opportunity to explore other avenues in himself and I think that um he probably you know got the bug to I'm sure he wanted to really you know do more himself I think he loved soft cell but I think it was already I mean art of falling apart I remember we were in the house in Leeds and he was doing the sleeve to the art of falling apart in in the living room I remember that very well and um and we were sort of talking about the mums at the same there was so much going on and I think that he was getting pulled a lot, pulled in a lot of directions, but wanted to, yeah, go off on a, a probably more of a solo adventure. And I think that the seeds were sown, you know, in a, in on yes. Untitled. And was your and was your kind of musical palette and bands that you were interested in was that sort of expanding quite rapidly during that you know that particular period as we trundled towards the mid eighties. I think I was already there with a lot of it. I mean, I think always expanding every single day, every right, right to the day, you know, that's, so that's always, but I think with Mark, we just found that we loved a lot of the same music and, 
I remember we were, we were obsessing on Scott Walker a lot. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, he introduced me to a lot. I probably turned him on to some stuff, but, you know, yeah, mutually expanding and, and already and already had quite a lot of stuff there in, in me anyway, because I just soaked up so much that, you know, already in, in life, because I just was mad on it, you know. Um, yes, because you did two albums during that period, almost kind of in consecutive years. Was there a lot of pressure on the kind of creative process and kind of personal dynamics? Yes, I mean, uh, there was a, a lot of pressure. We were on late night sessions, you know. I mean, Untitled was a lot, was still quite tough because we were, uh, that was definitely late night sessions, you know, but it was, and, uh, you know, first recording. So it was a lot of um, craziness going on, but we did, it was sort of a great time to, great music came out of it and it was a lot of fun as well. There was, there was a lot of fun, but, Torment and Terreros, the uh, was there's a more people involved, so you've got a lot of personalities in a you know a studio room which wasn't that big, and you know people are you know jealous, me too, jealous of each other or trying to get attention of each other or feeling insecure one minute, feeling over the moon about everything the next minute, overtired, over emotional, you know, you know the score, but out of yes. that out of all that like all of those uh, all of that sort of thing it um comes you know i think can, can come if you if you're tapping in the right places which i think we were great art you know but it was it was you know it was a ride that's for sure it was an emotional ride but i don't see how you can avoid that you know you've got a lot of people who are really talented just working to, in an extreme way you know because you all always short of time and trying to do 10 times as much as you can in the hours that you've got so with that you know mark yes. was a massive pressure because he's already a pop star he's already had number ones and a hit so he's got all that going on which we're not aware of i certainly wasn't you know you're not aware of in the in the in the in, in that you know one-on-one -on -one kind of thing that he was going through but at the same time he's still probably reacting to a lot of that and that comes in but you know that's when it's all, ah, but there's also the other side of that when everybody's producing this amazing music and we're all just high on that, as well as whatever else. <laughs> but, yes. you know. Did you, did, did everyone, I mean, how did that kind of project kind of finish? Did it sort of, was it a kind of conversation or did you, you know, just not turn up one day? How did that, well, which, you know, how does that? Well, which, which, because I mean, it, that was Mark. Mark and the Mambas. Well, uh, no, I mean, Mark just, no, um, we did Tor Torment and Toreros, and then and uh, we had a single out, which I co-wrote with Mark Blackheart, which came out in the June. Um, I think we did the Tel Aviv gig, did some gigs, and then, you know, Mark just sort of closed that book on the members, and we moved on to the next project, solo project. He was still doing Soft Sal. I think this, uh, this is still The Art of Falling Apart. I DJed that tour. And then he was doing this last night in Sodom and things were like getting very dark with the soft cell and he was just fed up with it. And we were moving on to um, the solo albums that he did first, which was uh, the um, yeah, Berman and Ermin and uh, Stories of Johnny. Stars. We did over in Germany. Stars Real wasn't until later, like 80, 89, but um, yeah. The uh, Vermin and Ermin and Stories of Johnny we recorded in uh, the first digital studio, which was uh, Hartman uh, Digital in Bavaria. So we went over there in 84 and that became Mark Almond. That was just Mark Almond, but the band that was he was putting together became the Willing Sinners. Right. God, there's just so much to get done, to get down, isn't there? Oh, God. So, so yeah. There was a couple of albums is that I can, I can, I can rush it on for you. So we did so we did those albums in Bavaria, which was amazing. You know, it was, a, it was a fantastic experience to be over there. And actually, while I was over there, I stayed over there when everybody went home for summer summer holiday break. I stayed in I stayed at the studio because it was it was gorgeous. It was in the mountains. There was a sauna. You came out of the sauna and you could jump in a, the stream. You know, the mountain stream. It was incredible. Yes. And uh, so I stayed for a holiday. And while I was there, yellow 
came in and started recording Stella. Um, and they had this track called Blue Naboo. And uh, I was like, I gotta say, I was pretty stoned on Californian grass in the studio having a relax. And uh, Dieter popped his head around and said, do you wanna come and play on this track? So I was like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was quite suited to my mood actually, because it was this rhythmic crazy track. And uh, again, you know, they just played me this craziness through the headphones and I went for it on piano. But that was a lucky, you know, just a lucky thing that happened um, because I was over there. So that, and they were one of my favorite bands. So it was a, a brilliant thing, you know. They played pinball cool. most of the time, I have to say. Well, that's <laughs> that's a... Equally go. So, so typical the, the way they were. Swiss gamblers. Swiss so, gamblers, indeed. Well, yes. So, and then the guys came back and we did more with Mike. Mike Hedges was, uh, was compressing and producing those tracks. Um, yes. so it sounded it, it, I mean he loved piano so I was sort of all right but it was it, it, I think I love those records but I do think they sound a little bit um compressed to be honest. he was going he was trying to go for a Phil Spector sound but I don't think it happened no. but, but I still you know I still think they stand up and they were great to do it live and because then, when you uh, worked on that where you get into that album Mother Fist is that the next one? Yeah, that's the next one, and that is one. I mean, that might be my favorite um, because I co-wrote like on the first two on the uh, sorry, Berman and Owen stories of Johnny. Even though I feel like I did write a, a, a bit of that, of quite a bit of those records, and um, there was no, it was just all marked sort of just they were just marked songs. Whereas on Mother Fist, I you know, I co-wrote about five of them, I think, and got more involved in, again, which was uh, as much more satisfying, you know, experience. <coughs> and I got to play, it. we did Mother Fist in London, and it was all fantastic, authentic instruments, which I got to play, mar you know, a huge marimba and a huge vibraphone and harpsichord and a clavinet or something, you know, the real stuff. And uh, a guy came in and played Nigel. Oh, I can't remember his surname. Great oh, guy. it's Nigel Eaton, because he was in a really fantastic... Hurdy Gurdy. Hurdy Gurdy, because he was in a band called Blow Isabella, who I used to love, because they oh, did a couple of... Paul you. James was the kind of the guy who did the, I suppose, the wind instruments, and Nigel used to do this kind of amazing drone on the Hurdy Gurdy. Far out. Sounds so amazing. So, uh, yeah. So that that's a great album of the Fist, I think. And although Mike Hedges did produce that, it's a much better. I mean, that's a, it. Sounds great, Mother Fist, I think. So it was a lot less on the old. I mean, I don't I hardly remember Mike being there. I remember more just being there with 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 uh, Billy and Martin and and the guys. But I mean, obviously he was there. <laughs> but, yes. Um, but it was yeah. It's a great album of the Fist, I think. And also, I mean, on the on that the next album, Stars of Stars. I mean, oh, yeah. you've got. A, the, pardon the stars we are good yes sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> there's an amazing song in there tears run rings as well can you remember much about recording that yeah yeah i mean i remember a lot about recording it all or the whole album yeah tears run rings is uh it's a great track that and that was um one of the ones that actually charted did reasonably well. I think they did did the Billboard in the, in the states, which we hardly ever. I mean, we did one tour in the states, which was pretty amazing. But only one. Yes, I mean it's almost like the Bowie period in the seventies. I mean, during that time, he he recorded one album a year, produced other people, did touring. I mean, your your output at this stage is kind of quite phenomenal. I mean, how were you managing to keep all this together, working with so many interesting and diverse people? Just because it's part. It's just what what you do. I mean, if it's what it, it's just what I did. So I didn't. I can't ever say that I've ever felt overwhelmed in that way. With all, it's just more inspired, totally inspired, and you just got on with it. You know, it wasn't. You didn't sort of think about it really. It was just like go to the studio twenty four seven, eighteen hour days, and you just did it, and that was that. Yes, <laughs> I didn't sort of question just... it in that way because I'm. I mean, I've got a high worth work ethic anyway, but also it's music, so sort of living and breathing if you if, if you know what I mean yes well sometimes people get a bit sort of exhausted destroyed just kind of can't do it anymore so sometimes there's those kind of elements that happen completely knackered but unfortunately 
I did go straight on to another project. So yeah, you get a point because <laughs> uh, that was I just was too it was too early to do what I tried to do, and also I don't think I was ever ready for it because I, I sort of did a, I did a I got my own deal after the stars we are, and that was a, with a project I did called I did a band Cactus Rain, but yeah, that was very I was too burnt out, too tired, too exhausted, too emotionally devastated by splitting up probably with Mark as well. So that never really happened. Sort of did it all, but it's like a bit of a vague sort of something happened, you know. Yes, gosh, that is. Well, you, know, you do get, I mean, you, of course you get, I, I think, you know, that it all suddenly becomes, I mean, like I said, during Torment and Terreros, it was all, all those emotions are on edge all the time, but it, it is sort of where the music comes from as well. So it's, it's trying to balance, do a balancing act. And we're, you know, a lot younger then, so emotions were probably quite raw and out there you know I was probably getting on every part <laughs> I was being really emotional but you know the music came and that's it's, it's what you've got to focus on that the, the work that's all that matters all the rest is just peripheral nonsense you know ego yes there you go so did you I mean whose idea was to do the Jack, Jack, Jack Brel kind of covers Mark's absolutely and uh, I went with it all the way because it's just fantastic you know uh, access Jack Brel through Jacques Brel and also, of course, through Scott Walker a lot as well. Yes. So w during that late 80s period, I mean, one thing that I did notice from doing lots of interviews with bands is that, um, so it, obviously that decade, is that mostly they have, you know, a, a certain period and then there's a kind of a next wave of, I don't know, 16, 8, 18 year old come, years come along and there's a new kind of musical scene and people get a bit tired and and suddenly especially during the 80s like the ecstasy world came came sort of trundling in as well so there was more emphasis on on dance music so a lot of bands started to feel a bit like we can't do this anymore so how was it for you then coming towards the kind of end of the 80s and into the 90s i never i've never had i never thought things like that i mean you're just trying to you you navigate the times and you probably switch you know try different music try switching around i mean you know, we were doing, you know, ecstasy came into our lives a hell of a lot earlier. You know, it's like 81, 2, somewhere around 82, I think. So it was all a lot earlier for us lot. You know, Cindy Ecstasy brought it over with ourselves. So um, that, yeah, the dance thing with the ecstasy coming in later was, uh, yeah, sort of already been there. And so I recognized it and you could recognize things were changing and everything but I think I mean I I sort of was I sort of did the sort of the ambient I mean a William Orbit did mix a remix did a early William Orbit remix for Cactus Rain so I mean I, I was aware that things were obviously changing and and the dancing was coming in very much but yes I think I was trying to move with it but it was just yeah you know I think probably a lot of people did but it wasn't it's not my I'm very good at DJing <laughs> and getting things in time in that way. But I don't know, dance music just, just like, I, I probably tried it, but I just, it was not a, not my, you know, I'm a songwriter and a musician and a composer, but yeah. Yes. So with Cactus Rain, did you, was that the main focus? Were you working on any other projects at that stage when you were doing In I, Our Own Time? I, I was, I well, just before then in 88, I worked with um, Barry Adamson and I guested on his Moss Side Story Genius album. And I was, I was working a bit with Zeke Manjika. And uh, I remember I played, Zeke got me to come down and uh, do a, a little piano support when he played at the Africa Centre, which was sort of mid, late 80s, maybe mid. Yes. And uh, Hugh Masekela was playing as well. And I met him, Hugh Masekela, which was Yes. So yeah, I was doing a few little bits and bobs, but I mean, once it practiced rain, it was that was full on because it was actually a massive deal. Um, it was just a, a very strange thing, you know. It was a massive deal, and it was going to be this big, huge thing. And then, um, a, I was burnt out and knackered. B, it was like we were recording at Blackwing with um, Eric Radcliffe, and it was it was kind of just when you know. Atari was kind of just it was sort of the big changeover with the computers and everything and he was sort of getting us to do everything on that you know and I'd recorded sort of quite naturally on my 12 track at home and then was trying to do everything I don't know it was 
it was a bit everything was a bit forced you know and then uh, yes. and had to remix it all so it was i was very engaged with cactus train and 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 nothing else for what while for those that year or two because if it thought for a minute it was gonna happen and then had you before that toured with the Style Council and oh, Paul Weller? Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, there's a couple of odd things uh, along the way, really. I did tour. Paul Weller phoned me <clears throat> when I was recording at Matrix. <clears throat> Excuse me, which Mark missed as we are, I think. And uh, he'd seen me playing Vibes on um, Top of the Pops or something, or, or Telly anyway. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, asked me if I'd come and play Vibraphone with the Style Council. And it was so weird because I absolutely could not stand their music. But, <clears throat> I kind of <laughs> you know, probably because he phoned me personally. And so I did go along. I did three tours, uh, I think one or two, a tour of Italy. I can't remember if I did two tours of the UK and one tour of Italy or two of Italy and one of UK. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's sort of had some funny encounters musically. I was thinking, I meant to say before, you know, when I was on tour with the stars, we are, you know, a funny thing was, in our in our road kit in our road crew was um there was this guy who was uh, uh doing our doing my keyboards and and guitars and whatever like the road roadie sort of the musician roadie and it, it was Noel Gallagher and it was uh it's so funny because the crew kept saying I was like oh where's Noel is he not coming out for a meal or whatever and oh he's up in his room with his guitar you know writing all his hits and they'd be like taking the mickey and of course you know he was he was he really was quiet as a mouse you know and just the roadie but yeah (laughs) turned out Mm. it was a crisis blimey that's amazing did you did you sort of come in touch with many other bands like the inspiral carpets and people like that who were (laughs) i think noel was also roadieing with them as well wasn't he yeah i think he was yeah i mean all those bands new order i mean sort of hanging out because the our crew which was um they called us pa which was Ed, eddie's unfortunately our monitor guy died um in the last couple of years so that was a bit sad but diane his partner diane was our front of house sound for years and they always did all the Manchester. i mean they did everybody you know all the manchester bands she she did inspiral carpets new order you know they were doing joy division earlier i met them I mean, I didn't even know I met them, but I met them at, at the Amnesia when I put a certain ratio on. They were doing the sound for them. And I was, I remember seeing Diane and thinking, oh, there's a, you know, a woman working with the crew, how fantastic. And then it, later on down the road, she turns out to be our front of house. And, you know, I did, I mean, she was a really close friend and we did, you know, we did lo- but back then we did loads of, uh, loads of great gigs together. Yeah. So she did all these different bands and, I'd be round at their house a lot over in Manchester in Ermston and, and all those bands would be round there all the time, one or another popping round, you know, but, um, Happy Mondays. Bez was always, yes. for example. So, yes, yeah, I saw everybody. Yeah. Oh, I, I just missed it. You said her, she's Diane and her husband and then what was the company called? Oz PA Hire. They were called Oz PA, OZ. And they did everybody. But, I mean, they were amazing. They were bloody hilarious. We always used to when, when we were on tour with them, like Mark and the and the Willingsons and whatever. We just were desperate to go on the crew bus. You know, it was your special treat was going on the crew bus, and they just get you stoned off your pants. And uh, and you, you know, if you were travelling for the day, if you're on a big like day for hours and hours, back in the eighties, you'd be so grateful for it. You know, just having a laugh with them for a day out. So yeah, it was good fun with them. The Oz, Oz PA, they were they, and the sound was amazing. Monitor sounds were sound on stage and the sound out front was always, you know, really fantastic. Yes. So when so when Cactus Rain came out, or well, the album in our own time, what happens next after that um release? Well, A, it wasn't um <clears throat> when it was meant to be uh, when the day it came out, it wasn't in the shops. They there was a, a mess up. So that completely messed it up from day one. Um I'd done a video for MTV and that they wouldn't show it because unfortunately there was a um Jamie Reed um did a video, the Sex Pistols guy and uh Mark yes. was his partner at the time and um there was a bit of a problem because her breasts fell out the dress in the video and nobody somehow had noticed it. So it went to MTV and they said, No, we can't show it. So it was just one of those things where it was not meant to be, 
it wasn't meant to be and I sure wasn't ready for it what I hadn't anticipated what you know what Mark was going through when you're a pop star it was like it was definitely not for me in that way <laughs> at all so yeah it was all a bit, a bit too much and I uh yeah I took it I did take a break after Cactus Rain just for a wee while and then just started moved it back up north and um built a studio up here and just yeah been sort of writing recording ever since one one thing or another yes blimey because you have been very prolific again haven't you well i not say again but but i just noticed your solo work in the last 20 years has been really prolific doing a lot of kind of soundtracks and soundscapes and collaborating with so many different people so that's been quite incredible actually so when did you, was it 2000 was it 2009 you started to sort of um come back into the musical world well i mean i, I put out something with cold spring <clears throat> like it justin from cold spring came to me and and wanted to like <clears throat> get some of my 80s stuff you know so we put together like a a reissue of a sort of extended expanded kickabye and i got like, yes Boonaboo with yellow and various tracks on there so i did that and did a few things with cold spring and then, and the last thing I did with them was actually Lost in Blue, which was like sort of a big collaborative thing. And then moved on to Downwards in uh, 2018. I did a, a record with Derek Forbes, um, bass player of used to be Simple Mind. And he's a, a friend of mine, um, introduced to him through a, 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 a mutual sound engineer friend of ours, Andrea Wright, who's a genius. And uh, we, we did a record together for fun, really, and then um, Downwards put it out. And, uh, you know, I started becoming friends with, with Carl. Started, we started a friendship that has grown and grown, and his belief in me, and he sort of signed me to Downwards straight away. And, and I've, you know, done solo piano records and various things through him and with him, which is, you know, it's been really good. It's been really uh, invigorating and inspiring and uh, enabled me to move into... Yeah, more into that soundscapey, cinematic kind of vibe, which is very much my favourite. You know, it's very free. You know, I can just yes. let the music out and and it sorts itself out rather than songwriting, which is, you know, it's more of a structured thing. Perhaps I mean, a bit free, but there's a bit of structure in there. So with Lost in Blue, because this is eleven track. Compila um, compilation collection i mean you work with some amazing artists kid congo you've got richard strange there you've got lydia lunch so so when did that project start to come about i um <clears throat> i saw dave ball and we had uh we went out for a meal and a drink and i asked him if he i just wanted dave to i just knew if i wanted to do like a big record for justin like i wanted to do some some good record you know a really good record so i i spoke to dave and i said you know i've got a few tracks which i've written with with a few people which because i had a few tracks like i'd done golden light with wolfgang and i'd written something with kid and etc and so i approached dave and said i had a few tracks and he was in straight away said absolutely yes um i'll produce and, and be involved straight away and he brought you know he brought gavin in and um and uh Darla and Celine because because uh, he knew them and, and um Medicine Head uh, Medicine John you know absolutely amazing uh, the Lost in Blue track yes and so yeah all and then um yeah I brought you know Kids and Wolfgangs what oh, I can't know what and I sang a couple of tracks on there um which was uh <laughs> Which they sound really good, actually. Quite, quite. Uh, it was, you know, it was brave, <laughs> but I'm pleased with them, and uh, I'm glad. I, I'm glad, you know, I did a couple. I mean, it was, you know, when I was reading reviews afterwards, people were like, "I should have done more singing," but yes. uh, it's, you know, it's a nice album, and it's, uh, uh, it sounds, it's, it's like I got, you know, for example, it was such a brilliant thing to work with Rico again on trumpet and get Saxon and get that kind of a bit of a sort of Soho you know, a bit of a Soho jazzy kind of sensibility to it, you know, it was quite a, quite a, it was a sort of jazz band type of vibe to it, you know, that we put through the whole thing. And yes, absolutely. It was really good fun to do, did a lot of the recording here and in London. And um, 
yeah, it just came together. And it was, you know, the last record I did with Justin and, you know, did it justice, came out on blue vinyl and, and all that, you know. That. Yes. I mean, I, I love the track Lost in Blue with John on vocals. But Zandi, he, he sort of did remind me a bit of John Lennon, actually. Oh, or... It was the, in, you know, you hit the nail on the head there because Dave Ball said to me, he's got this friend, John from Medicine, and he said that, you know, he, he does sing a bit. He sounds a bit like John Lennon. Can you write? him a John Lennon style track so I said oh I'll give it a go <laughs> and so I you know I did my best John Lennon uh, oh. know, channeled my best John Lennon vibes into the music and I sent it and he added that fantastic harmonica and then um, right yeah, I was listening to that today and I was thinking oh this is amazing vocals and I you know obviously I love you know Richard Strange and Kid as well yeah. but you know John's track is just particularly special yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? And it's it's I love it. I thought it was a perfect one to finish with because um it it seemed to sum up the whole sort of uh, the whole vibe really of the of the yes. in a way, you know. Very so with the project so with the projects you're working on at the moment, you I noticed you did a, a track very recently that's kind of um on Bandcamp called Summer Solstice that I was listening to. Is this are these mostly very recent compositions and recordings. Summer Solstice was just was was written, yeah, for, uh, on Summer Solstice. I think on the day I just recorded it here at home, um, and just popped it out just to put some, just to you know give something to the fans really. Um, yes. And we just celebrate Summer Solstice. I'd done a, previously done a Winter Solstice one, so it kind of made sense. Um, it does. I've um, yeah, I've recently. I mean, recently I've been I've done. With Regis, we did a, a Greek film soundtrack called Hospital for Beast. Yes. So that was real good fun. And um, so I've, I've just did that with him and did a remix with him for Yova as well just recently. And um, I mean, so, um, talking of summer solstice, talking of winter solstice, that is actually, and honeysuckle. I've had those tracks remastered, um, not summer solstice, the other two, winter solstice and honeysuckles, and they are the extra tracks I've got a, um, a, my two solo piano albums are coming out on CD um, for the first time, just a very limited, just 50 copies basically, um, coming out um, sometime in September. They're on pre-order at the moment actually, but yeah, so I've put those, I put a, uh, an extra track on each album just to, and, and I did a couple of videos as well, a, a wonderful video for Honeysuckles that, uh, uh, JD Waring has done for me. It looks fantastic. Um, immersive, sort of immersive noir journey, a sort of um, natural, sort of a black and white sort of journey through the forest. It's, it looks amazing. Um, so yes, yes, yeah, so I've got I've got those those piano albums coming out. So I've yeah, I mean piano's my I've got I've just got another piano, uh, 1880 upright. So I've been uh, and it's in a different key. It's, it won't. It's not managed to get up to uh, a, you know, the the normal tone, the normal tone of tuning. So it's uh, it's in its own key, but it sounds amazing. <laughs> and it's, uh, I might keep it like that. But I've been focusing. I think I've been focusing a lot on on piano again because I got this upright, and yeah, it's been uh, it's been fun playing a different piano actually. Yes, I could imagine. I mean, it's been, it's kind of interesting hearing so many of your sonic soundscapes. I mean, just going back to Lost in Blue then, did you write the lyrics for everybody, you know, like Lydia and Kid and no, Richard I Strange? I only wrote the lyrics for my own track. So I wrote Thunderstruck and uh, Lost Somewhere. But um, I wrote the music and they, you know, then I sent to them and, and they, yeah, do the vocal, or I record them doing the vocal, of it, and they write the lyrics yes. for, the, for, the, for those tracks. But yeah, but I did write my own. So, have you been finding yourself in the last five years? Have you, you know, kind of experimenting more with um, different textures and different sounds? I have, I have, and getting very much more into like into field recordings. <laughs> um, so, like during lockdown and just before, I was I. I mean, I I love that. I mean, because I'm sort of in sort of a semi recluse. I mean, I'm quite, I, you know, I'm not unfriendly with people or anything like that. But I tend to, I do a lot of music, you know. So I, I tend to be 
happily in the studio a lot anyway. So I didn't sort of, you know, lockdown wasn't like this terrible thing to me. It was like, yes, I can just be more in the studio. And I went <laughs> a lot, you know, just for dog walks, sort of local, doing recordings. I mean, I live very near the River Mersey, um, just across from Liverpool. And so I could go for long walks all the way down the front, all the way to the the other sort of the other end of the world, like to Hoy Lake and round the, the it's called the Wirral Peninsula here. I could just keep walking all around the river really, and do mm. very, you know sort of catch it at different times. And I did a lot of field recordings and at the docks and during fog and hearing the boats crying out for somebody in the lockdown and all that. So I did a lot of field recordings and then just hit the piano quite a bit or and and immerse myself into you know that kind of world even just opening the studio doors and letting the garden you know do the magic for me put a mic yes. up there and, and uh just have a couple of mics taking in all the atmosphere you know so yeah very much so i've, I've been experimenting more and more yes just, have you have you felt you much know? more connect have you have you felt much more connected to nature and the changing of the seasons well i mean i've always that's from day one i mean that's been my whole life has been that always very very connected to nature it's just that i've been recording it more <laughs> recently but i and it, um but it's always i mean that's just been you know as a kid i was you know i got i was <laughs> i was always the one i had you know i was bird watching i mean not in a, a I've never been like a let's collect birds, you know, just bird watching as in loving watching birds, should we say, you know, and I was in the wire as a young ornithologist club and I had the World Wildlife magazine and I was mad on animals from day one and going for walks. So I went to a farm every weekend when I was a kid and um, which had seven dogs and I'd be up at five in the morning and go and just go and be, you know, I mean, I was like five, six. I think even three we were there in fact I, we were because i've got a picture of me really tiny driving the tractor at three so yeah every weekend at a farm, in north wales sorry the farm yes so that was you know me from day one was all nature everything yes well i grew up in the the in, middle of east anglia in the countryside so i'm very much a country chap so yeah. That's life. It does happen. Did you, I do recommend, there's an app called, Mer, I think it's called Merlin, which you can just put on your phone and then you can listen to, you can tell which birds are in your air, you know, in your vicinity. Yeah, great. And the interesting thing is, is that sometimes you can hear things tweet in a way, um, but not quite sure what they are. And then suddenly you can be a couple of minutes doing this and think, I've got seven different birds around me. This is kind of amazing. So my appreciation suddenly goes up quite a lot. And also you think, oh, I always wonder what that little bird was chir chirping away there <laughs> in the background. Because you can't often see them, but it, I do recommend it. Because it, I think it's that thing, and you, you kind of have mentioned it a few times, being a bit more connected with nature than people. And um, it's something that I've noticed with myself and quite a lot of um, people of my own age. It's almost like just wanting to become a semi-recluse is quite tempting. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my, my excuse is that I'm in the studio. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But then you've you've also you appeared in a couple of books recently, haven't you? The, I've done an interview with Wesley about uh -huh. a book oh, called Wesley. Conform to Deform, which is yeah, good. And also... Um, some bizarre oral history. He had to uh, have quite a few chats with Steve, though. I, I gave him a gold medal for it. Yes, that was very good. <laughs> but but then also... Was, and also Kathy Unsworth, Season of the Witch. That's fantastic. Yes, so I managed to get interviews with both of them, and that has been an interesting yeah, one. Because she's fantastic, she's just so oh, she's so brilliant. There you go. I know. So have you been quite amused by the? Because when I was growing up, I must admit, goth, the goth rock scene was a bit like, you know, there. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it, sometimes it wasn't taken that seriously. But then this year, there's suddenly Kathy's book and John Robb's come out, and and oh, and goth has been kind of embraced as not just some some slightly strange kind of musical oh, yeah, genre. It so it's a, if there's a time to uh, jump on it, 1983, it's 2023, isn't it? Um, mm. So I think it's got a lot to do with that. But uh, yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think it always gets looked back in, in both ways. I mean, sort of the Batcave and all the Batcave bands and everything was, you know, some people took the piss out of it and some people loved it. And it depends probably what, Tribe you're in, or how square you are, or not square, or I don't know. People are always laughing at other people, aren't they? <laughs> they are. This is true. This is true. I, yeah. it, you know, in a way, you know, I've, 
I think when there's so much on the fashion in in the sort of close up, it's probably hard to sometimes listen to the music because I find that a bit with the early, I don't know, I suppose a lot of the bands that went into the Blitz, the Blitz kids, you know, like Depeche Mode. I think the image was kind of kind of there before the music for me at times. So I I kind of didn't sort of engage with it. And then years later or decades later, sometimes listen to some of these bands think, oh actually that's really good. But I <laughs> I just well, it's the swagger, isn't it? You've got the you've got the the swagger, the look. It was a whole thing, wasn't it? You know, it was like a holistic thing of of sound and uh, and visual and 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 um, you know, amazing videos were coming out then. As I was saying, it was like a big push of culture that the last really big one before, like you say, probably you know, dance music and what have you came in and I don't know, got more. And then Britpop. LTV. Yes, this is true. So with your, because I noticed a lot of your music is kind of on Bandcamp now. Is that where anybody, I mean, you've got the website, is that where anybody and everybody can go and access your archives? Yeah, uh, well, some of it, it's, no, not, I mean, not my, I mean, there's just some stuff's on there, you know, my, my stuff with Downwards, really, and, you know, a little bit of, because uh, I, I did that, I mean, um, I've put all the, the records that were downwards, so I've, I've done the two solo pianos, and I did without the mute, the, without the moon as well um, uh, in uh, 2021 because uh, it was like a birthday thing because I was you know, 60, so what? But it was just an excuse to do a little celebration EP. So that was without the moon, so that's on there, and like I remastered a couple of tracks off Kickabye because Thixo and and uh, Burning Boats, obviously, are just such brilliant tracks. So I've got those remastered in New York, and they sound fantastic. So I've got the originals on my band camp and the and and the the new version without the moon, but and Lost in Blues on there. But um, I mean Lexa music as well, where this where my um, the double CD in the book and the sort of a, a expanded book things on pre-order. That's there's um, the physical stuffs in there, like there's vinyl and CDs and that, and then. Also, you can get my stuff, you know, with downwards and and the cassettes I've done and the and stuff through uh, Boomcat. Right. So Lexa is your one of your go-to places, <laughs> isn't it? Do we say is in Lexa and then digital stuff? My digital is on Bandcamp, but also, you know, I I am represented on Boom, on you know through Boomcat. Yes, God, it's it's all it's all go. So, have you got any project? I know you've got some releases in September, but is there anything that you'll be working on I towards have, the end? Um, at the moment, um, I had a little break, and then now I'm doing um, I'm just recording, uh, which I can't say what what it is, but I'm doing an EP with Jarbo, which I think is going to be tremendous. I just oh love her God. so much. I just love her so much, and she's got just, it's just such a fantastic artist and an amazing voice. And you know, we've been friends a long time, but I, I sort of this EP I just think is going to be really special. Um, so I'm doing that, and I'm uh, really excited about that. And I'm also working with um, Thomas Cohen, Tom Cohen. He was in a band called Scum, I think, in the '90s. But I mean, he's sadly known also as the widow of Peaches Geldof. But you know, the guy's a, a it's like a the baby Nick Cave meets baby Bowie or something. David Bowie, it's like it's, it's with Scott Walker with various things in there and his own thing, you know. But I, I can see a few of those things. And Mambazi, he's very inspiring for me. He's like the first person I've, in that sort of way, that I've felt like in a long time to collaborate with. So I'm, I'm writing songs with him and sort of co producing. And, and we've, I've been doing stuff here in my studio, Blue. and We've also been doing stuff in Berlin with um, Boris Wilsdorf on that. So I think that's going to be a very special record. Um, done a few tracks so far. And, uh, yeah, got more, more recording to do in uh, in a few weeks, I think. Yes. I mean, it's quite a prolific time because, interestingly, kind of um, you mentioned, I think you mentioned Blexa, but I did an interview with, um, I think his guitarist, Alexander Hack. Oh, hi. Alex Hack, yeah, Alex. Yes, and he's he's kind of now doing a project and various albums with his partner. Have you been? Do you sort of also follow other people like that and where their musical journey has come to as well? Is the, the I know them and the the people are friends, so I, you know, keep an eye on all, on all those things, of course. And I actually tend to know about them. I mean, they're one of my favorite bands, you know, which is amazing. But, yes. Uh, yeah, they they were supporting. I in back in two thousand and fifteen, I think I 
um, Jarbo did a gig with Helen Money at Cafe Otto, and I went in and sat in on piano on a number. And then um, Danielle and Hack and uh, Alex were um, doing Hack Picacho, Picacho on the uh, uh, support on a Chaos Theory night. So um, yes, yeah. So we all hung out there, which was good fun. Fantastic. And with your 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 excited, I'm very excited about Jarbo because I've done a few interviews with her and I think her work is incredible. Um, yeah. So is that a case that with with collaborating with someone like that, you you just sort of send in ideas and files to each other? Um. No. I'm well. I mean, usually it's just been I send I've sent a piece of music and Jarbo's responded is what's happened when I did worked with Robin Rimbaud. Uh, on the the Scanny album, I did a couple of tracks with Jabo on that, and I just sent over music and yeah, like I said, she responded. Um, no, I don't really do it like that. I usually just you know do me and then uh, get whoever to respond and then I'll sort it out. Yes, my God, this is very exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's um it's a glorious time for music, really. I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because you can see a certain pattern that's happened that. We were all there sort of in studios, in recording, on stage, you know, very physical. And then, you know, with life, we just prefer to have our own space. It's a bit like going from a shared house, a student house or a, yeah, you know, one of those communities and, and thinking it's marvellous because you can all share things. And then you feel like, I don't want to do that anymore. I like my own bathroom. <laughs> I like I my own kitchen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I am. Um... So I know what, yeah, I do know what you mean by that. So, and it's, uh, it's you know, it's just a different type of freedom, isn't it? You're sort of with people and then you're sort of doing things on your own. I mean, I, I mean, I am working with people. Just sometimes I'm here doing it or, you know, I mean, I went to Milan with Regis and we recorded some stuff, a like temporary thing, what goes on. We started there and, like I said, in Berlin with Boris and we're doing Eros as well. Um, Regis is a band with Liam Andrews from My Disco. And uh, Boris, as I said, I'm I the Neubauten guy in the in the studio in Berlin, and and uh, I'm doing bits. Regis is fronting it, so we're, I'm doing that concurrently along with Tom, the Tom project. And um, I mean, they're all coming now. Like I said, I had quite a break, yes. sort of a rest, and then I've just sort of gone full on. Everything's com coming full on, you know. But that, that's yes. good. I think. I mean. When I have a rest, I usually just do other stuff, you know, because, you, you know, like you say, it's like the, the music does need to rest. So the new, great new stuff. And I've done so, I do, when I do get going, it's like, it's very, it is prolific. It does, a lot comes out. As at the moment, I'm like buzzing to go, if you know what I mean. It's like I'm in the studio all the time at the moment. I mean, I'm also doing a DJ mix. I'm back in 81 to 83 that we keep talking about because the, you know, NST Radio asked me to do, which I've never been asked before. So I'm doing one for them. And then I'm going to go over in, later on in the year and, and uh, do something live in their studio in Manchester as well. And it's because I did, the, uh, I did the DJ mixes for um, Real Talk. It's like a label that's through Boomcat. And they've got a bar in Manchester, sort of library bar thing in Manchester as well, a really cool place. And um and he asked me to do like you know to put, did I want to do a back cave mix of the DJ mix? Did I have any mixes online? I was like, well, no, I was doing it in the early eighties. So it wasn't online. So he he yeah he said, do you want to uh, do a back cave? So I revisited the back cave days, which was fantastic, and it like sold out in two hours that cassette, and they actually reprinted it, which they've never done. And then he asked me to do like, uh, you know, lead amnesia. So I did uh, a couple of lead am amnesia revisits, which was like 1981 revisited. And so uh, NST Radio came to me and just said, you want to do like, you know, they love those tapes and do I want to do sort of 81 to 83. So I'm sort of there at the moment, back there, as well as, you, you know, in all these different places, of <laughs> different projects. But, you know, I've got a little, I've, I mean, I'm, I'm double Gemini, should we say. <laughs> The Gemini Rising as well. So there's there's always four people on my head. So I can always be working on at least four projects, no problem. Yes. So with with that excitement, where does one kind of locate these kind of radio playlists? The uh, the uh, what do you mean the radio playlist? The one the one you you had the Amnesia one, Leeds revisited, oh, and then you had this. It's it, uh, I I've put the mixes up on Mixcloud actually because they were on cassette only, and it was right. like. 
it was for um you know gave the money uh, the money was for a ukraine i, I give it to a ukraine animal place i said I, yeah. I, we do animal charities so of the ukrainian war just started the awful tragedy so uh mm. yeah, we, did it, we did it for that but uh, so it was a while back so i um i've put them on mixcloud recently so it's just annie hogan mixcloud and that dear listener is the end of the interview Thanks ever so much to Annie Hogan for giving me the time for that interview. Um, as I probably mentioned at the beginning, I'll give you the website that she has and also her links to her Bandcamp page. This has been the C86 Show, David. So if you want to contact me, you can. On Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. All these interviews have been archived. You can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbeam. It's true. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.